Hi, I'm Lucas Ashley. I'm the lead pastor here at the Bridge Church, and just want to say thank you for taking some time to uh, join us in the message today. Um, but we want you to first of all know that we're just really praying that today's message is just simply a tool that the Holy Spirit uses to encourage you in your growth in your journey with Him. Um, but really what we're hoping is that it's a tool that is used in partnership with you being plugged into a local church community. Whether that's here with us in Bradenton or wherever it is that you might be watching from. We love anytime we can be an encouragement to somebody, but we know that that's what we're called to do is be a part of a local community and a local church. Um, but if it is a source of blessing in your life today, we just wanna encourage you to do three simple things. First and foremost, thank God for it. Any bit of encouragement or blessing that we can be is simply the Holy Spirit at work in your life today. So make sure you thank God for all that's going on in, or in and around your life. Um, but second is feel free to share it. You can share a link to the message or just share it through conversation as you're talking to people about how the Lord is working in and around your life. Um, but then also share it with us. We love to hear stories of how the Holy Spirit is working in people's lives in and outside of our community. You can do that real simply by emailing us at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. Um, and then you can also just follow along, whether that's subscribing to our page or follow us on social media to see what all the Lord is doing through the ministries here at the Bridge Church. Um, and last but certainly not least, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we continue to partner with the Lord and bringing hope to those in our community and globally, you can do so by giving through our website. It's bridgechurchfl.com slash give. We're praying for you today and hope today's message is a source of blessing and encouragement for you. Good to have you guys. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, for those of you if we have not yet met, and I'm the legacy pastor uh, here at The Bridge. And today we're doing something a little differently. Uh, normally, the way that we um, will do a service is, you know, the worship kind of prepares our hearts to be able to receive uh, the truth from Scripture that God has for us. And, and God really put it on my heart that this week what we're going to do is we're going to worship coming out of what He teaches us and what He reveals. And so you guys good with that? Good, because that's what we're doing. So, uh, so it's going to be it's going to be a little different uh, than what you're used to. And I just want to encourage you uh, to keep your heart open. We're going to be um, taking the Lord's Supper as well. So uh, make sure that you have the elephant elephants the elephants the elements available for you. Um, so that when we take that, that for those of you that are joining the broadcast, that you can join us uh, as well with that. And so what we're going to do is, I, I was just thinking about how fitting is it that, um, that the, and the very day that we're launching a new series on how to be strong, a, a new series that's actually called um, Ready for Anything, that as we launch a series called Ready for Anything, that we're under a state of emergency in our county. Is that like appropriate or what? How wild is it that there are uh, tropical storm warnings and look, you guys showed up. Come on, give yourselves a hand for that. And I thought, isn't that like God? Isn't that like God? That, that here we are in the timing of when we were praying and going, what is it that we felt like God was leading us into here in August? We felt like what God wanted more than anything was for you guys to be strong, for us to be strong. To be able to learn, where do you find strength in this world? And what you find is, is, is oftentimes your ability to handle the storms that come your way. And by the way, you do know that storms are coming. Do you not know that or do you know that? Because here's what I can tell you about you, that you're either in a storm now, or you're coming out of a storm, or you're going into a storm. And just like every year here in Florida, we expect there to be some storms that are going to come. You can expect storms in your life too, but God wants you to be able to be ready for anything that comes your way. And when you look at Paul's letter to the Colossians, you realize that's exactly what he's trying to do. 
He's trying, to, he's trying to help people who are just like us, people that came from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds. Some of the people that, that Paul's writing to are people that were raised with religious backgrounds. They were devout. They had their practices that had been meaningful to them. But a large number of the people came from all kinds of backgrounds where they just took kind of their pagan beliefs. They took some of their superstitions. They took the things that they kind of grew up with, the idols that they worshipped the things that they kind of did in their culture. They brought in all their culture with all of its sex all over the map in the Greek culture, all of that. And they were gathering together because their lives had already been changed. And and the Apostle Paul is trying to help them to go deeper, to send their roots deeper. And when when, when you're rooted in the main thing, which is Christ, you're ready for anything. And that's what Paul does in this. And so in the same way, let me read to you Paul's letter. And I'm going to actually read uh, chapter one, much of it. And I want you to receive it as though, hey, for what you're going through or what you're going to go through, God already knows. And he's saying, I got this letter for you. Here's how you can be ready for anything in your own life. And so I'm going to just read uh, most of chapter one. I want to encourage you guys, by the way, this week, read the letter to the Colossians, okay? Read it. If you don't have a Bible that's easy to read, easy to understand, let me encourage you, take the Bibles that we have for you. You can grab them from under the seats. You can go to the uh, Connect Hub, get a new one if you'd like. And and you can follow right along as we walk through the series. I'm going to go all the way to verse 3. This is God knowing what you're going to go through and what you're going through. And here's what he has your pastors doing. He says, we always pray for you. And we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You've had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. The same good news, which is, by the way, what we call the gospel, the good news about God's love for you, about Jesus' sacrifice for you. The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he's helping us on your behalf. He told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given to you. So we've not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way that you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better and better. We pray that you will be strengthened with all of his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. How many of you go, that's the power I need, right? (laughs) And he says, I want you to have all the power to endure the glorious power of God. I want you to be ready for anything. We pray also that you'll be strengthened that way. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people, those who have placed their faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And in case you forgot how great Christ is, he says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. 
For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities, even in the unseen world. You want spiritual insight? You want spiritual understanding? He created it. Everything was created through him and what? For him. Think about this for a moment. You were created for Jesus. You're not an accident, no matter what your parents have told you. You're not an accident. He says he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. You ever feel like your life is coming apart? Well, guess who's the one that holds everything together that can? He holds together all creation. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme, number one over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in, his, in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And this includes you who were once far away from God. Those of us that did not come from homes where we learned about God. Those of us had come from backgrounds where what we believed was all over the map. He's talking to non-Jewish people specifically. Some of you are Jewish in your background. Most of us are not Jewish in our background. He's literally including us in this letter. So he said, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, guilty as charged. Yet... Now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. I also receive that. But you must continue. If you want to be ready for anything, you must, be, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance that you received when you heard the good news. There's always going to be an undertow. There's always going to be forces at work that will cause you to drift, to begin to move away from what has changed your life. So he says, don't drift away from that assurance the good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body as he writes this from prison in case you wondered if he knew what he was talking about. He said, for I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know the riches and glory of Christ are for the Gentiles, you Gentiles, and this is the secret, that Christ lives in you. Yes, you if you believe. He's not just for the Jew, but for the Gentiles, for us as well. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect, that is mature strong, grounded, rooted in the main thing. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to receive that this morning and to, and to understand something that, that, that Christ is so great. Christ is so big, but it's easy for us to do what we do right now, which is we open up our cell phones and we look at what the storm track looks like. And we stare at the storm track 
and we wonder how big is the storm going to be? What is this storm going to be affecting? And we find ourselves absolutely mesmerized by an image. And every 15 minutes we check what the track has done. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. There are times in my life when God goes from being great to becoming pretty small. When I become so fixated on a challenge or, or the pain is so deep or the desire to protect so great that whatever it is, it's easy for me to default to my own natural ways of living and I forget about God and I forget about how great he is. I forget that all things were created by him and for him and he holds all things together and yet sometimes I forget how big he is. And if you're going to be honest with yourself, you'd have to say the same thing. Let me tell you how I know when my God has gotten too small. How do you know when your God has gotten too small? You know that your God has gotten too small when I hold on to Jesus plus something instead of Jesus only. Let me explain. I know that, that, that from walking with people who are on a spiritual journey looking for God, how hard this is. So what happens is we are raised in a certain tradition, certain ways of doing things. This is the way that you do it. Or maybe we weren't raised in anything. And so our spiritual journey is marked by all the things that we've kind of collected along the way. Our new age stuff, our horoscopes, our palm readers, our sound bowls, our Buddhist ideas, all these other things. What we do is we just kind of pull it together, our ESP, our this, our that. And all of those things are are a part of your spiritual journey. But all of those things weren't meant to fulfill you. That's why you continued to look. All those things were, therefore, was to help you to experience the emptiness of it to lead you to what you're longing for, which is Christ himself. But what happens is this, is it's hard to let go. Sometimes if we let go of all these things in the past, you feel like you're betraying your ancestors. I actually had a conversation with a guy that said, all my ancestors worshipped uh, this, this deity, and I feel like if I follow Jesus that I'm dishonoring my ancestors. Or maybe it's I was raised in this tradition, and I'm afraid that if I follow Jesus, uh, that it's going to be like I'm slapping my parents or my grandparents in the face. And what happens is, is we want to do Jesus plus this thing that I'm bringing into it. And I'm going to take Jesus, add him to this kind of lineup of that, what I have put together. And, and, and Paul says, you don't get it. He's so great. He created everything. Everything was created by him and for him. And he holds all things together. Your life has already changed with the little bit that you know. Don't add Jesus to that other stuff. What you've got to do is you've got to understand that Jesus, you've just begun to scratch the surface of how great he is. And I can tell you this. My Buddhist friends and my New Age friends struggle the most over this idea because what happens is you become enamored with your spiritual journey and all these things you've learned from this guru and that guru. But, but you have to understand for Jesus that this is an issue that is greater than you realize. So what do you do? You, 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 here's the answer to all of this stuff. It's to understand who Jesus is. The Apostle Paul in chapter 2, he goes on to say this. He's like, look, you want spiritual understanding? You want insight? Listen, in him, that is Christ, in him, Colossians 2 verse 3, in him lie hidden all the treasures of what? Wisdom and knowledge. Everything that you're looking for, he has. Everything that you're longing for, he offers. Don't add Jesus to all these other things. It's Jesus. He's the one that you've been looking for. He's the creator. He holds all things together. Here's what I always coach my, 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 my Buddhist and my New Age friends. I said, look, do yourself a favor. Set all that stuff aside. Like, make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. Stop tuning in to all those other things and watch how God responds to you. How do I know that this works? Because Jesus' half brother, James, wrote this. James chapter 1, 
starting in verse 2, he wants the believers to be ready for anything. And so he says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Really? Yeah, because God wants to show up. That's why. God wants to shape you. God wants to change you. God wants to make you strong through what you're going to go through. So he says, if you need wisdom, if you need that understanding, if you need that guidance, he said, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. And he goes on to say this. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and God. And whatever else the world is offering you. And see, for God, guys, this isn't a philosophical issue. It's a relational issue. It's kind of like this. If I, if I went to my wife and I said, oh, honey, my girlfriend is not up to making me dinner. Would you make me dinner? <laughs> She'd go, well, you think I'm going to make you dinner? Like, like oh, what, do you, what is this girlfriend thing? It's such a great disloyalty that she's like, why would you expect anything from me, right? In the same way for God, he's like, I don't want to confuse you. You don't add me to all these other things. It's not me plus all of those things. It's me. And that makes room for me to answer you so that when I give you the answer, you don't confuse it with somehow these other things gave it to you. It's not your horoscope. It's not it's not your palm reader. It's not the new age. It's not the sound bowls. It's not, it's not all this other stuff over here. It's just me. And if you are loyal to me, then you'll know that I will respond to you. And so I know that, that, that from just watching people's spiritual journey, that they think that God is small. So I'm going to add him to these other things. I'm going to tell you, then your God is too small. You don't really know who he is. Matter of fact, we see this happening in the scriptures. We're not going to look at it, but go and look at the book of Acts chapter 19. And here's what you'll see. That in Acts chapter 19, when people heard the good news about Jesus, they were so all in. They were like, I don't want anything to interfere with what God has for me. I don't want anything to get in the way of what God has for me. And so they literally took their books of sorcery, their incantations. They took all of the writings that they had amassed that were all an important part of their spiritual journey. But they understood that all those things did was leave them empty and prepared them for the real answer. And the scripture says that they grabbed their books and they burned all of them. And it says the value was over a million dollars of all those books. And so what we do is we, we make room for Jesus. It's not merely a philosophical issue. It's a relational one. How else do I know that my God is too small? I know that when I am more of a fan of Jesus than a follower of Jesus. I like Jesus. Everybody likes Jesus. How can you not like Jesus? He's amazing, isn't he? It's great. And, and here's the problem. We, we like Jesus as long as Jesus like, has one of these attached, right? Like when you go through a hard time, when you go through a struggle, when you've got to make a decision, and, and you have to choose which path to take, oh, we know which path we want to take. We want to do this so we can look back on it and go, wow. That was easy. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Jesus I want to do my thing. I want to believe in you because I am a great fan of yours. Thank you, Lord. That was easy. Yeah, this works great. I love this. And here's the difficulty. We crave and long for the life that only he can give. But we don't want him to tell us how to live. We crave and we long to be filled with the goodness of God. But I don't want to have to forgive. We crave and we long for personal fulfillment. 
but I don't want him to tell me how to work or what to do. And see, this is our problem, is we're looking for this, and we're hoping Jesus is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. But have you noticed that in your life that it's the hard things that actually make you better? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that it's the hard things that you go through that actually make you stronger? Have you noticed that the things that give you strength are not the easy things? And the things that help you to be able to be ready for anything are not the easy things. They're the hard things every time. Have you noticed that the things most worth having are the things that are hardest to get? And see, this is important because Jesus said things like this. He said, hey, you know what this is? This is the broad path. And this is the path that most people are going to choose. And it leads to the very worst outcomes. The easy thing, the natural thing, the thing that's natural for you to do, yeah, that, that's the wide path. And that one leads to destruction. But the path that I offer you is narrow. And there are so few that will choose it. But that's the path that leads to life. This is what you need. If you're going to be ready for anything, this is the Savior that you want. The God who's holy and can make you holy. The God who knows your identity and can give you that identity. The God who cares about you and he also cares about the way you're thinking and the attitudes and opinions that you hold and he's looking for beauty to be created even here where nobody can hear you. But he hears you. And there's something that he wants to do. You know, that's, it's so much harder to live that way. If you are looking for an easy faith to be able to make your life better, this is not the place. Jesus is not the one you want to find. Because following Christ is the hardest life that you will ever choose but it's also the one that makes you strong. It's also the one that leads you to the life that you were created for. And so what's the answer? It's to come to this great Savior, the one who created everything. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him, and he holds everything together. So here's what you do. Stop settling for easy. You don't know the power of God if you're going to live what comes naturally to you. But if you want to follow Christ, you will experience the power of God because he sees what you're doing. And he says, now that's a life that is ready for me to do something powerful through. Because that's a life that trusts me in everything. And sometimes the reason that your God and my God is so small is we're not doing anything that requires the power of God because we're just doing what comes naturally. And God's like, follow me. Follow me here. Follow me here. Follow me here. Follow me in everything. Trust me with your resources. Trust me with your forgiveness. Trust me with your addiction. Trust me with your sexuality. Trust me with your relationships. Trust me. Do it my way. Because the path that I'm leading you to is the path that leads to life. Stop settling for the easy way and begin to follow him. Here's the third way, personal experience, I could tell you, that I know that God, my God has gotten too small when I'm striving more than I'm trusting. What's striving? Striving is like worrying, only it's in motion, right? Worrying is being paralyzed and stuck in fear. Striving is, I'm fearful, but I could do something about this, right? Striving is when you act like it's all on you to figure it out. And I can tell you this, those that struggle the most with striving are people that did not have a good father figure and people that are very, very intelligent and good at solving problems. People that have been through a lot of pain. All three of you, all three of us struggle with this. 
Because for the person that has been through pain, you do everything you can to make sure that nobody else around you goes through any kind of pain. And so you're trying to protect them. You're trying to block bad things from happening. And actually the circumstances that are there to make them stronger, you're not letting them experiencing it, experience it because you don't trust God to love your kids and you don't trust God to love your family more than you do. Or you're just so sure that you can figure it all out because you are so brilliant. See, we don't have a problem with trusting God with things that we can't control. You know where we, where we really struggle with, with this is the things that we can control. That's where we struggle with it. And so here's what striving looks like. So my dad is, has been in a memory care facility. He has Alzheimer's. And, and God has unfolded everything that he's needed all along the way. It's been absolutely amazing. But uh, just a few months ago, he had to uh, go into the hospital, and then they sent him to rehab so he could get his strength back. And then they put him back in memory care, and he fell four times in like two weeks. And every time I get a phone call, your dad fell, and either he's going to go to the hospital or he's not going to go to the hospital. they got to do all this stuff. I get a call at 4.38 a.m. that my dad fell, and it's like, oh, no, my dad. He needs, you know what it is? You know, my dad, he's going to need a wheelchair. That's the problem. He needs a wheelchair. He needs a wheelchair right now. I have got to get my dad a wheelchair. I didn't call the facility. I didn't talk to the nurses. Nurses, I apologize. I didn't talk to anybody. I just went, I have got to fix this problem. And so I got on, I went to St. Amazon. And I said, St. Amazon, help me to solve the problem with my dad. And I researched wheelchairs real quickly. And I saw, okay, here's the one I want. And okay, buy now. Boom. Thank you, Amazon. And look what Amazon brought brought this chair and it's like, good God, I, I'm taking care of my dad. This is how to take care of him. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of small. Oh, I don't think he's going to fit in that chair. I, I oh, yes, uh, yeah, I got to say Amazon. I need your help because, because I got to figure this one out. And I didn't ask. I didn't bother checking. I didn't do anything else. I looked for the wider chair. This one is 20 inches wide. I think that'll be the good one. Okay, here I found it. Buy Amazon. Boom. And I got the second chair. And then I went to the nursing staff and I said, hey, I got, these, I got a chair for my dad. I know he needs a chair. And they looked at me and they said, your dad doesn't need a chair. It's important that he learns to walk with his walker to gain his strength. He slipped, but he's fine. Your dad does not need a wheelchair. And so they sit in my garage. And every time I pull into the garage, I have staring at me evidence of my own striving of a place where I didn't bother asking, didn't bother praying, didn't bother opening myself up to anything. I just acted like it was all on me. And here's the deal. When you go home, you may not have two wheelchairs that are staring at you to remind you, but you have other reminders. You got reminders of broken relationships because there's so much bitterness between you. You've got reminders of, of, of how you went and you grabbed what you thought was the right solution and how that brought so much stress into your family. You've got reminders of broken relationships because you've tried so hard to control everything so nobody goes through the pain that you went through. You've got reminders of how you came up with solutions and there was never a problem and it sits there and it stares at you. You've got reminders that sometimes... I mean, I trust God with my life, my soul. But sometimes there's a compartment that I feel like I can control. That it needs me to do that. What's your compartment? What's that place where you go, man, this is one thing I just have a hard time trusting God with my kids. I have a hard time trusting God with their teachers. I have a hard time trusting God with the future. Sitting on my knees. And God reminds me when I do that. <laughs> I 
I need to learn this. You need to learn this. Sometimes the most profound act of worship, the most profound act of trust, is to simply sit. When your mind wants to run ahead and catastrophize all the possible outcomes and scenarios, and when a storm looks so big, God says, have a seat. I created everything. I change your spouse. How about we start there? In Psalm 46, 10, the verse that you should have tattooed on your heart. God says this, be still. Maybe if it's just the the burden of guilt. Who is it that we're remembering? Who is it that we're thinking about? Who is it that we draw near to in this time? Don't you just receive these things? Let your mind follow along with images that we have reflection of God. Who is he? Christ is a visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. He existed before anything else 
and he holds all creation together. And he sustains everything by the power, the mighty power of his command. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme, firstborn over all who rise from the, from the dead. So he is first in everything. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. The greatness of God, the creator and the sustainer of everything, created you and invites you to a table to remember and to celebrate that his greatness is revealed not just through all that he made as creator, but how deeply he loves his Savior. So Jesus said, every time that you take this, this is my body given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. This is the blood of a new covenant, a new way of relating to me and knowing me. My blood shed for you, paid the penalty for all of our sin. And he said, every time you take it, do it in remembrance of me. you didn't know me, but now you can know me. And I can change you. 